me. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Rob. Very happy to be with you. All right. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to rewind the clock and take you back to growing up in Kansas City in the 70s and the 80s. And I'd like you to look at this through the lens of your dad, Kurt, who came from Nazi Europe. And, and, and maybe talk about in what ways did your dad's story influence what you're doing today? Yeah, it, it's so essential. And, and thanks, Rob, for, for starting there because it's really important for me. So just as a little bit of background, my father was born in a little village in Austria. And when he was three years old, uh, the Nazis came to the little village and they just threw, I mean, there were not very many Jewish families, uh, but they threw them on the back of a truck. Um, they had one little suitcase and threw them in the, in the uh, ghetto in, in Vienna and, and where my great grandparents died. They were diabetics and didn't have insulin. Most of the rest of that side of the family was all killed, but they very, I mean, it's kind of an incredible story, but they escaped into Switzerland, which most people who tried to escape into Switzerland were just handed back to the Nazis and killed. But my father and, and my and, and grandparents actually were successful. Then they were displaced persons in Switzerland for 10 years during the war, came to the United States in 1948, and they were just refugees, not speaking a word of English. They showed up in, in New York, and the Jewish Refugee Agency was just trying to get refugees out of the eastern seaboard to places in the middle of the country where they could more easily be absorbed. And so they gave them a choice of going to Sioux City, Iowa, Louisville, Kentucky, or Kansas City. No one spoke a word of English. No one had ever heard of any of those places. But my father, when he was a little kid, used to read these little German westerns. Um, and he remembered Dodge City, Kansas. And he said, oh, Kansas. Like, oh, I know that word. So they said, okay, Kansas. And then they, they sent them to Kansas City. Um, years later, when I was launching my campaign, I was running for Congress and I launched my, my campaign in Union Station. And what I said there is, so 1948, they arrive at Union Station and they had little placards with a string around their neck saying who they are. And when I was running for Congress in 2004, I got this call from this little old lady who wanted to meet and it turned out she was a little Irish American woman. Her job was just to stand on the, at the train station in Kansas City and look for people with those placards so she could say, oh, we're gonna take you to this house. Anyway, so whatever. Many years later, I, 60 years later, I, 55 years later, I launched my congressional campaign from exactly that spot. Anyway, so they arrived there, not speaking a word of English, um, opened a little kosher meat market and when Anybody would come into the meat market um, and they'd say, how much is this sandwich? And my grandmother would say, it's 25 cents for the sandwich and five cents for Kurt's medical school fund. And that was how, you know, that was how it all happened. He went to New York for his residency and, and, and met my mother. And then for me, so that was always a big part of my life. When I was a freshman at Brown, I met a classmate of mine who was a survivor of the Cambodian genocide. Um, and it would just kind of stun me. Here was this guy, my own age, who lived through basically a very similar experience to my father. And yet at that time, nobody knew about it. I certainly didn't know about it. And that led to kind of a, I had always been passionate about principles and ideas that I said, well, geez, if, that, if this is still happening now, and I'm just so lucky to be alive, just with this quirky history, what's my responsibility and that that's kind of a foundation for kind of most everything i've done <clears throat> you know it's interesting because when you met that friend in uh brown mm -hmm. and he's describing uh it's a he i'm assuming yes. um is describing the uh cambodian uh genocide you had no idea that genocide um was even going on yeah. and frankly most people, I believe, would probably do nothing about it and just move on and say, yeah, there's it's a lot of sadness in the world, that's for sure, and, you know, move on. Uh, but that's not what, what you did. You decided to work with a refugee camp in Cambodia. 
Where do you believe that that hard wiring that I'm going to call it um, came from? And maybe even talk about what that experience in Cambodia taught you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of hard wiring, I mean, I, I write about in my book, Hacking Darwin, which I know we're, we'll talk about later, about what's the relationship between nature and nurture. I mean, a big chunk of who we are is just genetic, and I'm probably some kind of genetic idealist and optimist. And then part of it is, is experience. And certainly growing up um, with, with you know, my, certainly my, my grandfather, my father's father died before I was born, but my grandmother was, you know, a, a wonderful person, but kind of a you know, person from a little village in Austria and, and her, whole, her lost brothers and sisters. I mean, it really, I feel like it would kind of touch anybody. But then there was the thing of why is it, why is it my personal responsibility? Um, because lots of people say, oh, there's a sad thing and, and now I'm going to go work for, for Goldman Sachs. And, right. um, and, and no, nothing wrong with that. Um, but I guess for me, I kept asking this question, well, what's my responsibility? There's like this, this you know, quirky um, thing that, I, that, I'm, that my father and his parents survived. And, and what, what's the obligation that, um, that comes with that? And I think that was really just an, an important piece. And then once you start going, and, and so you mentioned, so in, in when I was a 18, I went and I actually, I, I, that summer after my freshman year at Brown, I was, was, went home to Kansas City. I was supposed to be a counselor in a day camp. I quit on the first day, had a garage sale of all the junk in my parents' uh, house and bought a ticket to Thailand and on my own as a kid who, I, mean, I didn't know anything about anything, made my way to a refugee camp and volunteered. Um, and it was just like life-changing just to see all of this just sadness and it made me feel like well now that you I, I saw it and i saw it at such a young and impressionable age like it was hard to say well, all right but i'm going to go back i'm going to go back and i'm going to live some other life i just kept asking myself what's my responsibility um probably a genetics to ask ask that question and then i felt like well i didn't want to i looked at i considered like maybe i should just you know, spend my entire career working to help refugees. But it's just, if that felt like the end, there's like a long process for how a refugee is, is created. And these Cambodian refugees, and there's some Vietnamese and, and Hmong Hill tribe, like that came from the certainly French colonialism and the, and the end of the way that the post-war world was structured. And then uh, all these kinds of terrible mistakes that the U.S. made in, the, in, in uh, entering and, and engaging in the Vietnam War. There were like all of these bad decisions. And at the end, there's a refugee. And so if, you, if you're someone like me, I guess, who kind of tries to see the big picture, it's hard to say, well, I'm just going, I want to help refugees. But if all you do is help refugees, there'll just be more and more refugees. So then I started asking the question, well, how can I be part of a process of just helping the my country and the world make better decisions, and that that's, has been an important part of my. Okay, so in your in your book, which we're going to get into, but I'd like to sort of like the questions I'm going to ask you on your background. Um, I, I'd like to use the lens of your book uh, to sort of like answer some of those questions. And sure. we talked earlier about you know nature and nurture, but I'm I'm just wondering what your thoughts are here on sort of a third category, which would be spiritual, you know, that, that nebulous, I'm not really sure where to, where to put this in. How much of this do you think was your path? And it was your, like, this was just the way it was going to happen. And you were in a raft and you were just going down the rapids and there wasn't a whole lot that you can do about it, nature or nurture wise. This is, this is just your path. Do you ever think about that? Or do you think that there was any component there? Or is that just too woo woo? You know, it's not too woo-woo. So first I'll start with nature, nurture, and then, and then I'll go to spiritual. So nature, nurture, um, as uh, there are different ways, different terminologies people use to describe it, but there's a lot of who we are that's just our genetics. And you look at other, uh, other animals like the Lombard's chameleons in Madagascar. The basic way it works is the, the mothers lay the eggs um, then the entire adult population dies, 
each generation and then the eggs hatch and it, and it's kind of like there, there are no parents, you're just a, a, a chameleon. And so everything that you need to survive needs to be totally baked into your genetics because there's nobody around to teach you. I mean, you can have some good and bad experiences, but humans, I mean, one of the, the, the great assets that we have is that we have parenting. We have all of this opportunity in men beyond parenting to, so that culture can be part of our evolutionary process. And that's why we can, you know, our brains aren't that dissimilar from chimpanzees or bonobos, but, but we've been able to systematize our, our, our culture. And there's always a debate and there's twin studies that help get to the bottom of this issue of how nature, or how much nature are we, how genetic are we, um, how environmental are we or, or nurture. And my guess based on, I mean, there's like 18 million twins, pairs of twins have been studied over 50 years. I mean, if I, all in all, I'd say we're probably about half and half. It's just a, it's an informed guess. But then there's this question that you raised, um, Rob, of spiritual. And it's, it's really hard because what I always say is, um, you, if you believe that human beings are infinitely complex, um, then there's just a whole realm that we can't understand. And certainly the, the word spiritual, it, it connotes that, or when people talk about God or, or any of those things. Um, but if you believe, as I do, that human beings are single cell organisms gone wild over almost 4 billion years of evolution, whatever spirituality that we have is in some ways connected to whatever spirituality we believe single cell organisms have today. And that doesn't mean it's zero um, because there's a, lot that we, there's a lot that we do understand about single cell organisms. There's a lot that, where there's just the, the, this energy that was the first spark of life and, and all of life shares. We all share that common root. Uh, we're all connected in that way. And, and you know, there's a lot that we just, we just don't, uh, don't understand. So, but I, with your specific question, is this some kind of preordained path? I, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't believe in fate, but I do believe that we make decisions and then our decisions, our decisions form us in lots of ways. And then we're just constantly creating a new set of possibilities going forward. Like once you make one decision, your opportunity set going forward shifts. And so things start to feel inevitable, but you could, same person could be easily on some other path that would feel equally inevitable. Interesting. Um, okay. I want to uh, stay with Southeast, Southeastern Asia for a bit. You dug even deeper and you got a doctorate in Southeast, Southeastern, a I can't even say Southeast it. Southeast Asian studies, yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but you didn't, just, you, you didn't just get the doctorate. You, you went to Oxford to get the doctorate, right? And you became... Not to, not to pat myself on the back. And I did the whole doctorate in two years. Okay, right. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to get into all of these things that are going to make your, your mother very, very proud. Uh, we're gonna, I'm, she's going to be the first one I'm sending this to. Exactly. Um, so you became a human rights officer for the UN. What does a human rights officer do? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, basically, all of the jobs that I've had in my entire life people say like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, like, um, you know, you, you weren't like, you know, I, I sell hot dogs. Okay. I got yeah, it. <laughs> no, I know. It's true. It's true. So it was a little bit of background. Um, Cambodia, um, it, it was a French colony. Uh, then they got pulled in to, and then there was independence then got pulled into the Vietnam after a coup in 1970, got pulled into the Vietnam war. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge um, uh, took over. That's when the genocide happened. At the end of 1978, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia. Then there was a civil war that dragged on for like 13 years. Um, then in, the, in 1991, the peace treaty was signed to nominally end the civil war. And that, it was just at the end of the Cold War, called for a large uh, United Nations peacekeeping mission. Uh, and that's what I was part of. And that peacekeeping mission, there was a military component, there was police, and I was part of the human rights component. And our basic mission um, uh, was um, to help lay the foundation so there could be just basic understanding of and respect 
for um, civil rights and human rights as this war-torn country um, transitioned, or ho we hoped it would transition, toward some kind of, uh, of democracy. And so specifically, I mean, it was kind of crazy. I was this young kid, but there was all, all kinds of uh, ethnic and political violence, lots of murders. And we would go and we'd get in a little helicopter flown by these drunk Russians, fly out <laughs> way into the middle of the countryside in, in Cambodia and just plop down. And people hadn't seen helicopters. They, and, and people hadn't seen people looking like me in, in many, in decades. And, and, um, and then try to, to get a sense of what had happened. Like somebody had been killed, who killed them, um, why, what should the, U the UN's position be? And it just, it was a crazy, crazy uh, time. Okay, so you've, you've advanced uh, onto a ton of positions in politics from National uh, Security Council at the White House to senior positions at the State Department to uh, Deputy Staff Director of uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, mm -hmm. uh, where you worked with a, a guy that uh, we, we all know now. His name's yeah. Joe, Joe something or other, exactly. Biden, I think it is. Exactly, I agree. Um, so this is a two-parter. First part is if you could boil all those positions down that I just rattled off yeah. to you, what were you trying to accomplish with all of this? Like what, what, I know each one had its own thing that you were doing, but, if, but what's, the, what's baked into the DNA of all of this? Yeah, it's a great question. So for me, I mean, I think a lot of people, especially these last years, have begun to, to lose faith in what America stands for. But for me, even now, even after four years of this madness, still, as the son of a refugee, I really believe in the best values of, uh, of this country. Um, and uh, we've been battered, but those principles are actually pretty great. And, and I, I believe that the United States um, can be and, and must be, and for many decades has been, um, a real force for good in the world. And I wanted to make sure that I was doing my part to help America do that. And certainly in the, in the Clinton administration, it was just the end of the, of the Cold War. There was a lot of hope that America, and that, that's what the UN mission was. I mean, it was, it can this, the international community help bring peace to these war-torn areas. And, and certainly in my international work, I mean, America was the lead country. We rebuilt the world at the end of the Second World War in a very conscious way. It didn't have to be built this way. There didn't need to be a UN. There didn't need to be concepts of human rights and international law. And the US was in a position to kind of create any kind of reality in, in 1945. And, and so I, I, I've really been trying um, to use government to, not, to, to inspire, to work toward government to be at its best. And that's why this, you mentioned Joe Biden, my, my former boss, like this, it's an ongoing process. And, and you know, there's good on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, but we really, as a country, need to come together to try to solve our biggest problems. And I, I've always um, kind of, I've always seen problems in their, in their biggest, broadest sense. And that's why, for me, when I think of the kind of the big tools of, when I think about systemic change, governments are, are really important. Everybody else in my family is a doctor, and they're seeing patients one patient at a time. And that's, that's also a really great way to help people. But one is kind of more wholesale and one's a little more retail. That's really, that's, that's a good way to put it. So when you say everybody's a doctor, you literally mean all three, of, all three of your brothers are a doctor and your dad's a doctor. So my father is a pediatrician, now retired. My mother, who's 82, is still working as a psychoanalyst, a PhD. My oldest brother is an MD, a PhD, and a professor at Vanderbilt. My middle brother is an MD sports medicine doctor at hospital for special surgery. And my baby brother, I mean, he's, he's a grown adult with two kids. Um, uh, he is an orthopedic surgeon in Denver and one of the team doctors for the Broncos. You guys better step your game up. I mean, this, <laughs> I mean, this shit is horrible. This is unbelievable. Okay, so I can only imagine 
what this has to be like for you being glued to the television, trying to figure out who's going to win, who's not going to win. You have this connection to Joe because you work for him. And, you know, he's an old school politician. What's going through your mind when you're watching this? Yeah. So as you mentioned, Rob, I worked for Senator, then Senator Biden, Joe, uh, when he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I was deputy staff director. And he's a great, thoroughly decent guy. As you said, an old school politician, really about the one-to-one human, uh, human connection. And in many ways, it's... I think there's a feeling among many people, we have to restore something that was lost. I mean, that um, whatever your, your political views, I think the, the, everybody will recognize that, that uh, the Trump presidency was a pretty radical break from a lot of things that, we've, uh, that the United States has stood for in, in, uh, in the past. So I'm excited um, about, um, about uh, Joe Biden. And I, mean, I think at this point, it's, it's almost certain that he will be elected president. Um, I, I think it's exciting, um, but one of the things that, um, that this election has made clear is that America is, we have people living in just these hermetically sealed alternate realities. And so certainly, you know, I don't know, very, to be honest, I don't know very many people who um, voted for Trump. Um, I, for most people who I know, it's like, well, this COVID is absolutely terrible. And we compare the number of deaths in the United States versus Taiwan, where Taiwan acted early and well. It's seven people have so far died in Taiwan and, and the numbers in the United States keep, keep ticking up. So most people who I know say this was like a fundamental failure. Um, the, the language coming out of the White House um, is so incendiary. It's so divisive. It's alienating our allies and our, our uh, and empowering our adversaries um but i i'm also very mindful that we have to bring this country together i mean america is all kinds of very decent people on all sides and if we if we allow ourselves to descend into this kind of tribalism even if like me and i'm pretty open i have my my, my sympathies are on one side of the political spectrum but i don't want to discount all of these other people who I'm, I'm from Kansas City, I, 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 I certainly know the mid- Midwest pretty well. Um, these are really thoroughly decent people who are just living in a different reality with different, different inputs, uh, different news sources, different cultural references. And, and I just think I'm, I'm certainly very excited about, um, uh, about uh, now president, I'll say it the first time, President Biden um, being uh, being elected, um, but he said it right. He said he wants to be the president for everybody, not just for the people who voted uh, for him. And I hope that we can begin stitching this country back together. I mean, we didn't fight World War II as Democrats and Republicans. We fought it as uh, as Americans, and we have so much more that pulls us, that draws us together, than pulls us apart if we allow ourselves to see that. So I'm really hoping, I think now is the last time we need to do, we don't need to do any kind of victory lap. We need to say, well, how can we, how can we come together? Recognizing that we don't agree on everything, but there's a lot that we agree on. And we're in the middle of this terrible pandemic that we need to fight together. Have you seen the social dilemma on Everybody Netflix? Everybody asked that. I've, I've seen the first part. I haven't uh, seen all of it. I know, I know some of the people um, Justin and others who are um, are featured. So I'm very what, what you just described yeah. is the social dilemma, but it's exponentially played out in the movie. It's crazy. All right, so we're going to play a drinking game, and it's every time uh, you get another uh, degree, we're going to do a shot. <laughs> um, as if all of this wasn't enough, you decided to go back to school one more time yep. and get a doctorate. This time you figured, eh, I'm going to go to Harvard. So you went to Harvard and you got a doctorate in I got, I got a, I, So my, just to be clear, um, my PhD um, is from Oxford and I have a law degree from Harvard Law School. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I, 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 I didn't I, want to I, misrepresent I, myself. No, God knows. No, no. We don't want to do that wrong. So you got, you got it in human rights. Am I correct? 
So I got a, a law degree within so my- law, my law is Harvard. Law, Harvard law degree. I okay. focused on international and human rights law when I was at Harvard Law School. But my law degree was a, a JD like, like every other lawyer. Just your, your, ever, your, your average everyday Harvard law degree. Okay, got it. Um, in 2004, you went down sort of a completely different path for you, or at least my estimation. Mm -hmm. um, and that was to write a historical novel um, called The Depths of the Seas, mm -hmm. um, which was essentially about a, a CIA desk officer, let's mm -hmm. say. What was the motivation behind that book? Why'd you do it? So when I was in Cambodia, um, both working in the refugee camp in Thailand and then in, uh, living in Cambodia, um, there was just so much that was happening. I was taking so much in. Um, and I later wrote about that in my PhD dissertation, which was an analysis of why the world failed to respond to the Cambodian genocide. But being around the actual people, there was so much emotion. There was so much just raw feeling of what does it mean to be in that kind of environment on the deepest human levels that I, I, just, I needed to get it out. And the, the, a, a PhD dissertation with thousands of, of footnotes, it just it left a lot of kind of emotional turmoil. And then it just like, it started to, I started just imagining stories and scenarios. And, and one day I just realized that I needed to put it all together into a novel where I could just be, have a green light to kind of share all this emotional stuff that was welling in, in me. Um, and that was, it was great. I mean, it certainly was, was cathartic. And that was my, my first book and my first, uh, my, my second book, so my PhD dissertation by that time was published, but uh, my first novel. And it, it just, it, 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 it opened me up to just thinking differently about how to express an idea. I mean, in addition, I, I still do a lot of writing that's either kind of academic or, or policy writing, but now I've written three novels and it just, it's, it's a different way of telling a story, a different way of reaching people, even about very real stuff. Okay. Now you decide to write another book and that book is called Hacking Darwin. Well, that's, uh, Hacking Darwin is book five. So we book, have, yeah. Okay. There's four more that I missed. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're just going to pick it up from Hacking Darwin because yeah, we're yeah. never going to have enough time to, yeah, to yeah. do your life I mean, because you're, you're 217 years old. So that's the, the only way you could have done all of this stuff. Exactly. Um, okay, so the book is officially titled Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. Why that book? Yeah, so that, so um, you mentioned briefly that I worked on, uh, we, may, we discussed briefly, that I worked on the National Security Council and I worked in the second term of the Clinton administration and my boss there and now close friend was, uh, is a person named Richard Clark. And Dick, if some of your listeners and viewers will remember that he was the one, the White House official who essentially predicted 9-11, but couldn't get the government to, to act as he, as he wanted. And then he became very well known after, after the 9-11 attacks. I remember so that. This was well before 9-11, but Dick always used to say that um, the key to effectiveness in Washington and in life wasn't to see what everybody else was seeing. It's to anticipate what are the big challenges that people aren't seeing and try to address them before they, they become even bigger uh, problems. He later wrote a book uh, 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 called Warnings with R.P. Eddy about these kind of Cassandras. And so for me at that time, I, I looked around the world and the issues of the genetics and biotech revolutions were, I just felt it was going to fundamentally transform our lives and yet people weren't really meaningfully talking about them. And so I decided well, I needed to learn everything I could. So I, you know, I had taken a biology class since 10th grade of high school, but I taught myself advanced biology. I um, started re just reading everything I could, interviewing people, learning. When I was ready, I started writing policy articles on the national security implications of the genetics revolution. And I got a lot of great attention for that. I was invited to testify before Congress about these issues. This was many, many years ago. Um, and then I, uh, I realized, like with, um, with my book, The Depths of the Sea, 
um, that I needed to, to tell this story in a way that people could hear, that this was about the future of all of us and not everybody reads you know, obscure foreign policy journals like Foreign Affairs, um, but everybody, everybody appreciates stories. So that's why I wrote my two uh, near-term sci-fi novels, Genesis Code and, and Eternal Sonata. Um, and, but when I was on the book tours um, for those books and I explained the, the genetics revolution and the, its implications in my way, because I, like I said, I was self-taught I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a natural storyteller coming back to your, your genetics, nature, nurture. Um, all of a sudden I could see people's eyes widening that um, they, there was this, they knew there was DNA, they, they'd heard the words, but when there was a story explaining what it meant, people said they, they were able to place themselves in that context. And that was when I realized that I needed to write a book, hopefully the book, um, on the genetics revolution, what it means, where does it come from, how is it going to change all of our lives, and then how can each of us be part of the process for determining uh, how we deploy these incredibly powerful uh, technologies. And so that's why with, with um, Hacking Darwin, it's kind of, it's a book about science, but I really um, hope that it's a book that people can take to the beach, that, that families can read together, and then discuss over over dinner. And I've received just some incredible feedback from from readers that makes me feel that that's it, that's starting to happen. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the concepts in the book, um, just at, at a high level. Just some some uh, low hanging fruit questions that I have. Let's say um, you discuss AI in the book. A lot of people, when you talk about AI, it freaks them out because they think about sort of the inmates running the asylum. Mm -hmm. What What is your thoughts about that? And do you think that we have anything to worry about where, you know, robots are going to take us over? So every technology has its better and worse uses. Um, and with every technology, we need to ask the question, well, how can we optimize the benefits? I mean, you can just look at just simple things like, like the plow. I mean, the plow, some people say, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. It allowed us um, to increase our agriculture culture yields, increase population. Other people say, well, wait a second, we've destroyed the planet with all of this agriculture, this stirrup. You think, oh, is, wouldn't that be great? Um, you, can, you can ride a horse without falling off. Well, the Mongols figured out how to use stirrups to have wars. And, and in my, I love Mongolia, but they certainly wiped out a lot of, a lot of people. And so AI, it's incredibly powerful um, technology, and we need to be worried about it. I mean, we need to be mindful. We need to think now about how we can best architect artificial intelligence so that it serves our purposes and, and, uh, and, and doesn't get away from us. I think that's really important. I think it's important uh, to be cautious. But... In certainly in the near term and even in the longer term, there are so many incredible applications of, of AI. We have a million people dying of car crashes every year. That's a million people will be saved once we get these, these erratic humans away from the steering wheels. We have um, so many people dying of undiagnosed diseases um, from uh, treatments, the diseases that, that will be treatable in the future because we're able to use our AI and, and, and other technologies in order to treat. And so you know, history, technological progress is part of the, uh, of our, it's, it's part of, of what's great about our species. And the key for us is just to make sure it's, it's serving our needs as much as possible. And that's why there really is a place for the Stephen Hawking's and the Elon Musk's and others who are saying, hey, let's be careful and we need to be mindful of that. Um, but that doesn't mean we stop. It means we, we are thoughtful about how we, how we build these kinds of systems. Yeah, Elon Musk is, is basically saying, hey, there should be some sort of regulatory commission um, because this is, this is the Wild West. We don't know what's going to happen and we need yeah. to begin now. It always seems that... Um, you know, Congress, politics, whatever you want to say it is usually behind, you know, like we're just still regulating the internet. Um, and we're a little bit behind there. 
Um, but, uh, but I want to ask you some questions about some of this. I'm going to call it biotech. I don't know if it's biotech or not, but basically, you know, there are people now that are afraid, you know, that if there's a vaccination, that there'll be some sort of chip or some sort of something that's going to be put inside these vaccinations and the government is going to be tracking us. Um, or, you know, there are people on the other side saying, well, you know, you can, you know, you can sort of get uh, something implanted in you and you can figure out whether or not you're, you know, uh, if we ever had something like COVID that was starting to happen, we can, ha- we can be monitored and we could know in advance, hey, look, this is happening. And then there, there's all these, yeah, this is going to do this and it's going to be great, but it could also do this. So like, what's your thoughts on, I don't know what the word is. I'm calling I mean, uh, injectables or something that's yeah. going to go in our body. I don't even know what it's called, but you, you get yeah. the point. Yeah. So um, for sure, technology is coming inside of us. I mean, right now, uh, I'm looking at you now, you have your, your AirPods. I'm, I'm a little bit lower tech. Um, we have our phones that we're carrying around. There are some people who already have that technology inside of them. And those are people with pacemakers and cochlear implants. Um, we're all, you know, I'm sure almost all of your, your uh, viewers and listeners um, are immunized. So that is bringing some pretty advanced technologies that's fun into our bodies that's fundamentally changing us. I think most people think it's changing us in a good way, but it's changing us. And I wish we could say, I mean, we're now in this race to develop a, a, a vaccine for, uh, for COVID. And I certainly hope we get one and I hope, or maybe multiples, and, and I, hope, um, I hope that they work. Um, but it would be too easy to say, oh, anybody who has concerns about vaccines, those are just you know, crazy Jenny McCarthy anti-vaxxers. I mean, a lot of them are, um, but there's a real reason to be concerned um, because vaccines are systemic changes to the human. In most cases, um, they're, they're extremely helpful. I and mean, anybody who, is, who live, has gone through black plague or all these kinds of smallpox, these terrible things that Ebola, I mean, it, it's like that's not a time for ideology when Ebola is raging through your village and, and killing lots of, um, of people. But this vaccine is going to be pushed very, it is being pushed very, very quickly. Uh, President Trump has tried to politicize that process to say we're going to get it even more quickly and we need it quickly. Um, but normally there, there's a lot of trials um, for vaccines. And I, I certainly think that, especially now um, that, that our, our government in the United States is taking this process um, seriously. So. You know, I, it would be too easy, too facile just to say anybody who's worried um, is just a crazy person. They're not. Having said that, um, right now with, um, uh, with COVID-19, it's a pretty scary situation. Um, and so I certainly, I, don't, I won't be the first person to get a, a COVID-19 vaccine, but once it's proven safe, I certainly will do it myself. Um, but we can also see, I mean, in, in, in some of the examples you gave, or, or it's, it's easier to see, look, you look at China, um, where there's a massive surveillance state where people are having uh, DNA samples taken, which are being used to keep tabs on people, where there are monitors everywhere uh, that are, are um, uh, monitoring uh, people's coming and, and going. And that's, that's why what I always say is technology brings us to the conversation, but the conversation is ultimately about ethics and values and how those are realized through our regulations and and political systems. And again, it comes back to this thing. If we have an inclusive um, process that people feel that they're consulted and engaged, not everyone's going to go along, but at least there's a sense of of empowerment. When people feel that they're totally disempowered uh, and not consulted, I think that's when worse things can happen. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about um, genetics and anti-aging. How long do you think that we could live for knowing what you know is Mm -hmm. coming down the pike? Yeah. So the the person um, who has lived the longest, who's known to have lived the longest, is a woman named uh, Jean Calment uh, in France who lived to be 122. So 
we know that with this biology um, that we're born with, 122 is the upper range of possibility. Yep. Um, but I think that we're going to be able certainly to push out average lifespan. And so average is just um, the, the entire whatever national or global population, how long they live divided by the number of people. And that we can do by just basic simple stuff with uh, better public health and sanitation and exercise and, and nutrition and, and, and all of those kinds of things. But I also think there's no reason why uh, we won't be able to push out um, healthy lifespan um, just because biology is very hackable. I mean, that's the core message of the, of the biotech revolution is that all of biology, including our own, is ultimately readable and writable and hackable. It's incredibly complex. And so it's hard to change very complex systems. Um, but I, I definitely think um, that we are going to continually to uh, push out average lifespan and healthy lifespan. Uh, and then I, but I do think that over time, even longevity will be able to, to push somewhat. I don't think we're ever going to become immortal in the, these physical forms, but there's, there's a lot of opportunity. In your lifetime, how long do you think you can live? So there's two questions. How long can I live and how long can I live healthy? Um, yep. In my lifetime, I think, I think 115 or, or something is probably as long as, uh, as I can live. But for me, the game is how long can I live healthy? And so right now, there are people who are super agers who both live a long time and live healthy for a long time. And there aren't that many people who start to have deterioration um, in their 70s, who make it to 100, uh, 110. And, and so one of the reasons and one of the benefits of having all of the genome sequencing and all these other interventions is we can study the people um, who are these super agers and they are genetically different from people who aren't super agers, but we don't need to, we don't need to change everybody else's genes because genes um, instruct cells to make proteins. And so we can just say, well, what are those proteins that are being created? And can we find other ways of, uh, of supplying those? So my aspiration, I, you know, I tell people all kinds of, of junk about living to 150 and whatever, but I feel like if I live to be, you know, 115 and I'm healthy um, uh, most of that time, that won't be because I, I exercise a lot or eat healthy or have a positive attitude. It will only be because of pretty dramatic, exciting scientific interventions that have already begun to happen and, and will happen increasingly over the, over the course of my, I guess, 63 years to get from here to there. All right. I'm all in. In the last minute we have, what one question would you like to ask me? So I guess the, the thing is with, with you, I mean, you're all about um, how do we find the balance between our mission in life and kind of having fun with that. And, yep. and how, do you, how do you think about that? And how do you think about, um, there's like the word play, um, it has a connotation of frivolity, but it doesn't need to. Like, how do you think about connecting kind of the mission stuff and play so that everything is, is driving meaning? When you are in the shower and you get an idea, it's because you're not working. Mm -hmm. It's because you are not grinding and banging away at a computer. When you are on vacation and you come back with a notebook full of ideas, it's because you're not grinding. We are not meant to be one dimensional and work only. There are so many components to us from the spiritual to the romantic to the fight. Like there's just a million components to us, but we dominate in one area, which is work. And I would argue that if you're willing to spend some of that time outside of work, that your work will grow because you're not exclusively in work. Yep. I totally said it beautifully. I totally- Amen. Listen, yes. I, got, I got to end this because I, I promised yep. you a hard out and I don't want to yep. be the guy that didn't give you the hard out. Anyway, really just my great, great pleasure. And thanks for doing it. Great to meet you. And, and, and thanks. Dude, it was awesome. It was every bit of what I thought it was going to be. Enjoy awesome. the rest of the weekend. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Alrighty, bye, man. Bye-bye.